Okay, so just moving on to, we're going to cover, I do have a question. I mean, you brought it up. So just thoughts on the Inflation Reduction <laughs> Act, um, both of you just broadly, is this going to level the playing field? Um, to some degree, I see it as America is reducing the cost. Like, whereas in, in, in Chile, you know, they're, they're putting on royalties to raise SQM's cost. You know, here, America's uh, lowering uh, potentially the cost of producers and developers. But broadly, ha ha thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act for lithium? For lithium, I don't think it makes much difference, honestly. I do think it makes a huge difference on the side where you get the kilowatt hour credit and there is no criteria on where the material comes from. I mean, that's that's huge for a Tesla. That's huge for anybody that uh, is is producing packs, sales and packs in the U.S. or quote unquote a friendly country. I would love to think it's going to help lithium a bunch, but <laughs> let's just see if any projects can get permitted in the United States. And then you can say, okay, Canada's fair game. And yeah, Jigger can loan money in, in Canada and let, let's let see what happens. I'm not sure that the American taxpayer funds on the loans could go to Canada. I think the Department of Defense, that there are some grants that might work. The loans are one thing. They're loans. They're not grants. There's just... Um, but, but it's the investment tax credits that matter, right? This this 45X and 48C, you know, 30% on the CapEx reduction and then 10% on the overall OpEx. That, that's really the leveling of the playing field that I'm talking about because that's free money through the IRS code. And those are direct payments. So even if you don't have a tax liability, you still get the money. So that, that, that must be, that should be positive, I guess. If you can get permitted, then the loans should help and those tax credits should help. I guess there's one other balancing act, Joe, I'll be interested to hear your view is the, you know, in order to get the EV tax credit, you need a percentage of the raw materials. So the question is, will this translate into OEMs just saying, no, well, I want production all of your production from the u.s or will they will there be a bit of a perk will there be an offset given that the the final buyer will get a 7500 credit because of local raw material i i i mean we already talked about the gm uh, live event thing and i mean i think i i just don't think there's enough to go around <laughs> in in the in the near term uh, to, to, to make a big difference. But the other thing I think that people are ignoring is there's an election in November and then there's an election in 24. And depending on how it goes, I don't necessarily think the Inflation Reduction Act holds up because there's we're in a political environment where I think that to a large extent, supporting green energy is political and it's unfortunate, but I'm not sure the, the Inflation Reduction Act survives 2024. Well, it would be January of 2025, <laughs> but- uh, yeah, I, I don't think the upcoming elections this year can will change, you know, that that's now law. So I, I don't think even if the House or Senate changes that they're gonna rip that up and a lot of the Inflation Reduction Act was a, a geopolitical security of supply thing, not a, a green energy thing. And there's bipartisan support on localized supply. I would disagree with you on that. I, I think when, when they say things are bipartisan, bipartisanship doesn't last very long in the United States in these times. I would disagree with the fact that you say it's, well, it's now law. Well, look at some of our other laws that happened from, from 2016 on. And until we have a, a desire to be nonpartisan, and, you know, there's a lot of people in this country that don't still aren't behind the way oil, the oil industry has been treated and thinking that, you know, all, all oil is bad. And you, I, I think a backlash is possible. And I think we'll see what happens with inflation. 
but the Inflation Reduction Act's not going to reduce inflation. Poorly, it's a poorly named bill. I agree with that. Well, that's that's why I I, I mean, let's, we can just disagree on that, which is fine. I'm not saying it's going to be canceled or anything, but I'm just saying I think it's still. I think it's there's so many things that are unclear that it's really hard to say it's a it's definitely it's it's certainly not going to hurt lithium investment <laughs> that, that's for sure but how much of a help it is yeah i think rodney's right i think on the if you're going to get the tax credits like they did with the oil industry decades ago uh where you got to depreciate things in two years instead of 16 or whatever it was depending on what type of capital good it was yeah that's good that's gonna that's gonna have a positive effect but you have to have permitted projects i mean let's let's talk about in the best case scenario everything that's viable gets permitted the us is still at a a huge deficit to the to, to the coming demand because you can build cathode plants a lot faster you can build lithium projects that that, that that's true and i don't think uh, america united states self sufficiency in lithium is realistic but if you throw in canada into the mix then you're getting close but you don't have to have 100% but I believe in a similar way that we had somewhat oil energy independence over 10 years through fracking and, and, and horizontal drilling and all of that, you had major investments in that for a long period of time. If you had that same type of investment in lithium in America and in Canada, and I think Canada to some degree might follow U.S., you, you, know, you may have this uh, lowest common denominator, right? They, they, they don't want their projects to lose out. So I'm looking forward to see if... if there's tax policy and, and benefits in, in Canada as well. But if you look at both of those, we could have a huge boom of investment in both countries and get to maybe 60 or 70 percent, you know, self-sufficiency. I don't know. Maybe that's too high. A, a million tons out of a three million ton market by 2030, like as a, a big, hairy, audacious goal. I've, I've put that out there as as an idea between Canada and, and the U.S., the question here, do you see a risk of demand destruction based on the high lithium prices you're you're forecasting? Both of you. I do not. Let's let's just go again, memory lane. 2016, price didn't jump over 30. It got near 30. A couple of transactions might have been over 30,000 a ton. Everybody was saying, oh. This will kill the battery market. The battery market, and you know, nobody did the math on what the percent, especially in a high nickel cathode, what the percentage of lithium cost was in those in those products. And yeah, it wasn't high for that long, but that didn't destroy demand. It's not destroying demand right now. And What's Tesla's backlog now versus when price was 10,000 a ton? I think there's some people that, that won't buy. I think the bigger issue is China has the democratized EV market because there's an offering for everybody. There's You can get a $4,500 Wuling or you can buy a big Tesla or any of the, the, the Ch new Chinese players. We don't have that. I think the more important issue is what's the government going to try to do to make sure it's, the EVs aren't just for rich guys? Because as long as there's a lithium shortage, there's going to be a bias to make the high-end vehicles. And I don't care what anybody says. Mary Barra can't come up with a high nickel platform where she can sell a car for $25,000 and make money. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a key point, Joe. But I mean that's kind of been the angle for EVs from the start. Is the easy pickings were the high end, yeah, where the margins were, um, and uh, the all-in cost of running the vehicle is also something important. I guess that'll be what is it cost to charge and run, uh, and those that you know relative to oil, but. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the number of EVs on offer, that's exploding. I guess the biggest issue is, can the OEMs make enough of a living to keep this going? Because they're the ones who are going to take the squeeze, I think, to be competitive and to price it. Unless, you know, even with the credits, 
we'll see if they can hold the price. I mean, the Cybertruck has just gone dark. I don't hear anything. I don't know where that's going to be priced now. Um, there's certainly not going to be a single motor $40,000 model anymore. And the limit, if I remember in the IRA, I think is 70, what is the income, Howard? Is it $75,000? Uh, no, it's higher than that. Oh, oh, I, think it's, I think it's, I think it's, I, I think a married couple filing jointly, it's over a hundred. Uh, I, I don't remember if it's 125. And then okay, if, you're, so, if so you're single, it's I think it's under a hundred if you're you're a single filer. Because it has something it, like that. So I guess yeah. that the trick is, can you make a viable car and still get the 7,500 and everyone make money? So um, I, I I think this is. Again, Tesla led the way by putting LFP in Model 3s. And I, I, that's my point to the U.S. auto industry is they probably need to capitulate on their high-end offers offerings or the ultimate you know, high-nickel platform. Oh, but on the yeah. low end, they probably need to take a much harder look at LFP which then gets into the carbonate and hydroxide. But it also, it also gets into the uh, CATL is the main manufacturer of that, and there aren't really non-Chinese players in the LFP market, are there? Yeah. And there's more of them now. I mean, Vivas Kumar just shipped his first sample. For okay. That, that, <laughs> still early stage. Okay. But like, as, hey, as, Vivas, yeah. I love you, but uh, yeah. No, but okay. <laughs> but let's look at it. Johnson Matthew was making it a long time ago. And then that Nano One owns that plant now. Admittedly, yes, it's not just CATL. It's I mean, it was Ford I mean, CATL, you know, that MOU, well, that the, MOU that's now on hold. That was meant to be, you know, for their uh, their truck, whatever that, uh, um, the E-Transit, right? You know, yeah. the thing that they were going to do in Mexico. I mean, that was, that was a big thing for, for when Ford announced that. Well, my counter to you would be it's going to be simpler to transition to LFP outside of China than it is to build a bunch of lithium operations in in the United States. OK. And yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's going to take some time. And you're absolutely right. You know, CATL right now maybe has a bully pole, but they're not the big cathode guy. I mean, they're, you know, go back to the pool leads and you know, my buddy, Yuan Gao, who used to run that, but yeah, fair point. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it'd be interesting to see they're going to have to, there's going to be a lot of, I guess the point is raw materials is a difficult cost to get around, but they're going to have to find every and any efficiency to stay competitive and make EVs fairly priced if prices are going to be where we think they are. Joe, you've uh, rightly said, I think, we believe in the selling fear, you know, of China is definitely, you know, the battery arms race and all of that stuff. We, we've added our voice, you know, to that. But fundamentally, the Achilles heel, you know, go long with China's short, right? Go long with Tesla's short, and they're short raw materials, right? So is it fair to say that Chinese raw material domestic production, you know, both brine and hard rock, will almost always be a rounding error in global supply, especially for the, the tier one battery? Yeah, I, I would absolutely say that. I mean, I've been going to Qinghai since 2002. They spent billions, literally billions of dollars. And there's, you know, they announced 20 years ago that next year they'd have 50,000 tons of high quality carbonate. And now after billions of dollars in 20 years, they got about 50,000 tons of, marginal quality carbonate that's seasonal and then you add in i mean i've been up in sichuan province at almost four thousand meters and you know the underground spot you mean mine it's they just don't have good resources so i i believe that china has the just in lithium not in the other metals china has the greatest vulnerability and they're they're not going to be able to start a lithium war because they're going to lose it quick because most of the europeans who'd like to do conversion i don't i don't know when they'll ever sort that out but admittedly there's a desire there but in the u.s australia is a, a friendly and a lot of spodumene could come to elon's 
quote unquote refinery in the Gulf Coast of Texas. We, we want to. I want to talk about that. Joe's industry expertise in living in China, et cetera, like on China related questions. I, I, I defer to your you know expertise. But Rodney, do you have any thought as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was that was the question that I raised. Is uh, is is that is you know, will China get out of it? I think. There's a number of issues and reasons on top of simply poor quality resource that's going to make it a problematic for them. And in the end, you know, uh, and Joe's had lots of guys on his podcast, qualification and quality keeps the standards keep improving. So if your resources, if you're looking at more and more marginal against a requirement that's getting more and more stringent, good things aren't coming. That's the reality. Well, Rodney, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, you wrap the ESG concerns in with this and it becomes a, a toxic mixture for the globalization of selling Chinese EVs. Cause a lot of people aren't, you know, if you can't, if you don't have a CV that you can show where your battery material came from and that it meets certain criteria. Uh, I mean, they can get, they can get sold in China, but. I agree. And I think that's the shakeout, Joe, and it'll come my way this end of town and elsewhere in third world markets, they will ship out and, and they do already in their cars. Yeah. But in the major auto, the European and US auto markets and some of the others, North America and so on, it's it's going to be an uphill struggle. And there's also other issues of jobs and all sorts of things. So aside from that, it's, you know, I still think there's going to be some difficulties in actually meeting standards you know, to, to qualify into the decent vehicles. And that's, if you look at the average price of a new vehicle in the US and elsewhere, it's nearly triple what it is in China. People buy much more up end of cars and the standard requirement is higher. I want to go into uh, the point you just made, Joe, about, you know, Pilbara or others uh, from Western Australia into Texas, or maybe it's uh, Louisiana. I mean, those are two places that Elon Musk talked about, but Piedmont just announced something in Tennessee. So, and that could come from uh, East Coast ports. It could come from Southeast ports and then barged, you know, up, you know, into Tennessee. In Piedmont's case, they're planning to import from Ghana, spodumene. But when I spoke to Pilbara, when we spoke to Dale Henderson, we asked him, you know, long-term about that. And, and he said, like, as a short-term solution, shipping, Spodge, I mean, it could work, but it's not an effective carrier long term because there's so much waste. And he believes that you know an intermediate product, you know, lithium ion, I'm sorry, lithium phosphate or lithium sulfate, you know, that they hope with calyx. So, what do you think about that long term? Are we going to be shipping spodge, I mean, not just to China, but you know, to America and other places, or does it have to be some intermediate? Well, obviously the intermediates, the, the favored path, and it's, it's a better, it's a better situation for the guys in WA. If they can, if they can do that, they'll, they'll, they'll capture more value. I mean, the real win for all these producers in WA is ultimately how they participate further downstream. And, you know, obviously that's been part of Ken's mantra. It's now part of Dale's mantra. I I think desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. So if the U.S. had to rely on spodumene for a series of years, uh, they would they would do so if the, if there wasn't a better opportunity. I mean, how fast will Canada ramp up spodumene production? So I I mean I I think it's. Uh, there's a lot of nested variables in that whole question, but I I totally agree with what you know Dale told you guys. I mean, I, I think that that's where they're going uh, in terms of uh, shipping a lot less product, getting a higher value, less capital required on the on the other end with the customer. That's um, obviously the better situation. Well, a a AMG in Brazil is making a technical grade carbonate and shipping that to their hydroxide plant in Germany. But in Germany, you can't, you know, there's just no place for the waste, right? If you're not mining it. So they, they I think they have to, they have to do that. Um, but Pilbara is shipping rock to Korea, you know, with the Paz LX process. That's not an upgraded product. 
And then you have, you know, this debate, you know, Piedmont's using the Metsu Ototech, Critical Elements is using that, Keller is using that. Tesla didn't say that they're using that specifically, but they did say it's a sulfate-free process. You know, other companies are are, are not using that. Um, I don't think Albemol is using that, um, you know, or Tangshi, you know, in Western Australia. So what are your thoughts, I guess, on if you're using a, a, a Metsu Ototech process, I, as I understand, the waste is less. I, I would classify no that. I would classify that as DLE ish in that who's doing it on a large scale commercially right now? No one yet. I mean, but but whatever. Sabine and Caliber are going to be using it, and that's an initial scale. Critical elements and and others have not. Your friends, uh, your Russian friends at Holmec, you know, were supposed to have a big deal <laughs> in Russia. I, I'm assuming that's on hold now. But yeah, no one's doing that at scale. Never yet. bet against Pavel. That's my advice to you. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to, by the way, I forget um, the guy who the, the, the chief operating officer of Sigma. Brian, tell Brian, him. yeah, to him at the Sigma event, and he he talked positively about Metsu Odutech for whatever that's worth. Yeah, again, that's not an intermediate product. Like like I said, you know, what's a short term and medium term solution? You know, to have conversion because there's a lot of where Sig like Sigma could sell their product not just to China. Right now, they can only sell it to China, but if they were to want alternative markets for that. I don't know that they're planning to upgrade that to a sulfate or some other, it's not been in their business plan. Two European companies would sign a contract with Sigma tomorrow for spodumene. Yeah, like Northvolt and, and La Vista and, and, and whatever, the Aurora yeah. and all those groups. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ed, I, don't, I don't see that. I don't, I don't see that as Sigma needs to start making spodumene concentrate get their legs going with that and then you know they can look at alternatives if, if you're sig if you're sigma why would you cut a deal with a startup as a counterparty that's never done this before you know compared to you know selling it you know to a known quantity at seven thousand dollar price i think I, I see sigma having significant negotiating leverage in that regard i you know they anna and calvin are going to do what they're going to do and and i think they'll they'll probably make a, a decision that makes sense for Sigma. I'm just saying that there are counterparties out there <laughs> that are backing some of these guys that I, I, I guess that's about all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. We, we covered kind of like hard rock to kind of Europe and the U S what about, um, you know, South American brine to hydroxide refining, you know, in Europe or U S or, you know, ex China, Asia, um, like all Cam Naraha, and you talked a few times about like GM Livent. Um, what, what do you think about that as a, you know, and then there's also Chile is a free trade agreement country with the US. So that would fit, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, but Argentina isn't. I don't know if that could change or, or what that'll mean, but just as a, your thoughts on that, Joe. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think the Argentine thing is going to be a barrier. Uh, I think it's a, it's a friendly, um, and whether they, they need to do some paperwork to sort that out, I, I don't know, but I've been talking about Carlos Galli's been on the podcast a couple of times. We talked about Argentina being the bridge to Europe, if they were really serious and you've heard other, you've heard producers like, uh, now all chem back then galaxy talking about making a non-battery grade product to ship out and to be upgraded somewhere else and that could have been to another product in argentina or it could have been to europe as a feedstock and i think that is a very viable strategy and if i was europe just from an esg perspective i would certainly rather be dealing with less waste that a, a carbonate a hydroxide process would would uh create than uh importing spodumene i mean i've i've talked about both because i think there, there aren't that many options and you got to look at all of them but carbonate it's just a matter of the economics don't work for a converter at the prices we have right now right 
Okay. Do you have any thought on that? R Rodney is uh, had load shedding in uh, South Africa, so he got disconnected, and now his, his background's a little bit different. And um, you know, Joe had the opportunity. He, he, to, he, to he's still as handsome as ever. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the dark a little. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know, Joe summed it up there. I, I think. There's also, you know, from the European perspective, I mean, essentially what Joe's saying, and we understand that is there are limitations to what is on offer on the continent. It's not North America. Um, so you, you have to look at it slightly differently. And you, you know, sometimes, you know, beggars can't be choosers, you've got to go with what's what's on offer. It'll be interesting to see if, uh, you know, morals versus it's a bit like now with the power and gas and whatever if morals supersede, um, you know, cost. Okay, well said. So last uh, question on in this segment before we move to corporate activity, what, what you uh labeled over the years, the drama in the Atacama, Joe, we taking a page from that, but using our pop culture references, I, I used to call it, you know, the, the big chili following, uh, <laughs> you know, my uh, University of Michigan uh, alumni status. And forgive me, like Michigan lost to Georgia, you know, in the national championships. We didn't have that battle, you know. On and they the, may but again. <laughs> I was very disappointed with, it was a huge surprise season for, for, for me to even get that far. But anyway, thoughts on SQM's investor day. And then I'm writing here the 2030, you know, people talk about mine life, you know, as important. Slaughter.com is gigantic, but SQM as a company has a 2030 mine death, you know, unless they renegotiate their contract with their public partner, you know, so what do you think about what they said, you know, in the Solar Futuro, and just broadly, you know, thoughts on what you heard in Investor Day last week, I was there in New York with them, I have my own opinions, but uh, curious yours and, and Rodney, um, having read and listened to that. I did an interview last night with a Chilean newspaper with almost exactly those questions. And they're, the article is supposed to come out in the next 48 hours. And the question really was, what did I think about SQM's future? And did I think it was the right thing for Corfo to continue with SQM? And, you know, my opinion is it's absolutely in everybody's best interest to for SQM and Corfo to extend the agreement, to have peace in the Valley. And obviously Corfo now, I mean, I think you probably have the number. I think you quoted it yesterday, the amount of the amount of royalty income coming in now. I mean, it's a, it's in everybody's best interest for to maintain lithium stability in the Atacama. And, and I don't think, playing chicken to 2030 is the right right strategy to be employed. I think SQM is trying to paint a humbler and greener picture of themselves. Admittedly hard to do, but they, at least they're trying to do that. I'm publicly stated, I, I was friends with the prior CEO. I am not friends with the current CEO, but it, that doesn't really matter. Uh, I am an investor in SQM, have been for a long time, and I, I hope uh, they they come to agreement. I think there's huge egos on both sides of this, and you have you know, what's going on in the background politically in Chile that also makes it stressful. But there was a you know point of light when the with the constitutional vote, and there that things are still up for grabs. So yeah, I think SQM can and should continue. People may be surprised at me saying that, but I think it's just pragmatism. And their their DLE, um, you know, and desalination plant discourse, like the, the, the CapEx that they put out there as perspective, it's still early days, but is much more meaningful than the, they had the unbelievably low capital intensity to grow from 50 to 150,000 tons. This will be meaningfully more expensive but you know they've got to be more sustainable right it's all 
it's going to be a long negotiation here, but they threw out that carrot. We won't make these investments unless you extend. And it'll be interesting to kind of watch. But what do you what do you think about, you know, because the, the, the DLE aspect of it has gotten a lot of attention as well. As I said, uh, there are big egos on both sides. And in there, you know, SQM has never been uh, a easy to get along with company. I mean, Felipe Smith is a great face for the company. Everybody loves Felipe, but SQM as an entity is pretty much a my way or the highway negotiator, even with customers. And I know that from years of experience, be that as it may, <laughs> there's just too much at stake here. And I think on DLE, I don't think they have anything right now, but talk. And I think they are scrambling and I can't really say any more than that. Okay. Rodney, your thoughts on the investor day? I mean, look, you know, we have to give credit to the rate at which SQM has ramped up. It's been impressive. There's no doubt about it. Um, they've matched or exceeded my forecasts, and that's the first time in a while. So they're certainly doing their bit from a revenue perspective um, and paying their royalties. Um, I agree with Joe on the the DLE and and the outside of it, but they've they've done a good job and they've rejected. They you know they they're well exposed now to near term pricing and the upside. I think there's a bit of confusion in the market and understanding what SQM gets versus what the spot in China is because there's you know there's VAT and 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 freight costs and all sorts of things. Um, so it's always going to be skewed to lower. So they're actually doing, you know, better than I think than people think. You know, in a in a market like this, you know, below battery grade is still going to get very good prices. I remember Joe making this point the last time. You know, when the market was tight, there was a difference. But when it was when it was oversupplied, but when it's tight, the differential. You know, people are desperate for materials, so they get paid top dollars. In a tight market, they're always going to look good. They've ramped volumes well. They're keeping their costs reasonable. They're paying at these prices good royalties. But yeah, it, it, it seems it would make sense to have the devil you know with some oversight. And uh, they seem to be kept in check. You know, if things have, have gone out of kilter, they've been... They've had requirements to, to bring them back into line. And and the truth is, you know, freshwater usage, I mean, the guys know the asset well and, and they don't use as much as others. So I think from a Chilean perspective, the revenue is good, regardless of the emotional sentiment around it. And, you know, I think uh, how they've, they've done, I mean, their, their expansion has been impressive in, to my mind. I hope the Chilean state brings back Eduardo Bitron to, uh, you know, help further negotiate over the next kind of couple of years because uh, he did a great job. I, I think he should be on SQM's board. <laughs> I I saw a quote I read. He, he was hoping like they over the life of, of that contract to 2030, I think he, he was hoping in 2018 that it would bring eight billion dollars over the whole period. And I don't know what the numbers were. You know, but they were in the multi billions already in the first half of this year. So, uh, hats off to him for helping the the Chilean people to some ex extent to SQM and the company and shareholders' expense. But um, anyway, it's the the balance of the public private you know partnership 